Hello and welcome. Master of Horror John Carpenter spent most of the late 1970s and 80s scaring the daylights out of millions of movie fans around the world. His films included the 1978 classic Halloween, followed by The Fog, The Thing, Christine and Prince of Darkness. Then, crossing over into sci-fi films, he directed Escape from New York and Starman with Jeff Bridges. John also directed Assault on Precinct 13 and Someone's Watching Me with Lauren Hutton and his then-wife Adrienne Barbeau. But in the mid-1980s, he turned his dark and sometimes crazy view of cinema storytelling to San Francisco's Chinatown and Big Trouble in Little China. The film for 20th Century Fox starred Kurt Russell, Kim Cattrall, Susie Pei and Victor Wong. But John, who not only directed but also wrote screenplays and the musical scores of many of his films, was not a happy person when I spoke to him shortly after the film had been released in 1986. He complained about the egos of many of the studio executives and said while they claimed to be the filmmakers, referring to movies as their films, when it came down to it, they were really just deal makers. The executives in the studio... The style with which they operate is it, just, it's just gotten out of line. And I'm not the only director that feels this way. A lot, a lot of us are saying, what's going on here? Can you exemplify it? I mean, what? Well, there's a, there's a game that's played in the studios, and you're hired on. They beat you up about, about the budget. They overcharge you overhead. They put charges on your budget that only go back in their pockets because this is how they make profit. They charge you when you, you really have a 32% fringe benefit on top of uh, on your labor costs. They charge you 44% here and pocket the rest of the money. And then they, they beat you up for going over budget. Now, we didn't. We stayed on budget, but it got to be outrageous. And some of the tactics they use are like uh, accusing people of stealing when they didn't. I mean, just outrageous crap. And then in the finishing of it... Uh, I just don't like to be treated uh, like a janitor by some. And it takes the fun out of it. it, it it's a fight. It's a destructive, arrogant, uh, discounting atmosphere. And that's been my experience, and I haven't had that bad an experience compared to some others. I've heard some stories that are just, just numbing. And um, do, do they interfere with you creatively? What do they do? Yeah. But they tried. They tried, and it's you spend most of your time fighting over nothing. Much ado about nothing. They're fighting because they want to fight. Because they're trying, probably just trying to establish their own. Establish control, establish power. Corporate space. Ego. It's enormous egos running around. Enormous. Are they the people who are not quintessentially filmmakers, but they're deal makers who been brought in to run the studio? Well, yeah, uh, they are. Um, <coughs> they see themselves as filmmakers, and listen, uh, the people who run a studio, the management of a studio, has a right to, since it's their film, they put up the money for it, they have a right to have a hand in what the product is. I mean, if you're going to make a, an action-adventure picture, they think you're going to make one, and you turn them in a a love story, well, they might be upset. Mm. Uh, I think that the professionalism has to exist on both sides. The director and the creative elements have to be as professional as management should be. And I'm just saying, wait a minute, management's not all. It's all, but it's very unprofessional. Mm. Have you worked with another studio before? I've worked with Universal and Columbia and now 20th Century Fox. And so what you're saying applies only to 20th Century Fox? Well, I'm, just, I'm talking mainly about 20th right now and my experience here. Uh, I had a wonderful time with Columbia. And uh, Universal was, uh, was tricky. Uh, you, you, might remember, you might remember that uh, when Brazil came out here, this kind of, I don't know if you're familiar with what uh, Terry Gillen went through. Well, mm -hmm. we all kind of go through that. Depending on how much power we have, and Spielberg doesn't go through it, but I would go through it. And Really, it's not, it's nothing that I can't handle, but it's no fun. At, at what level 
Does this go on? Does it go on at the very peak of the management structure, or is it middle management, or is it the people who are directly above? Well, I, I, you know, every place is different. Every place is different. It's run by individuals. And <clears throat> for twentieth, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the problem comes from the fact that you have a company that's a billion dollars in debt, and they got a lot of pressure to turn this place around. And they have a management policy that says, you know, we're going to do it. And they finally had a they had a quarter, I think it was their last quarter, they made a million dollars profit. Finally, after a billion in debt. And they got a lot of, it, it all has to do with stockholders and it all has to do with, this is a privately owned company. So you've got this enormous business overlay and ego here, sitting here. And you've got all the filmmakers making movies here. And um, <clears throat> there's not a lot of going. Between the filmmakers and no, I mean, we're all like, we're like aliens together. I don't. What we should be is in the same boat. You see, mm. we should be partners. What? What? Just talking on the sort of business to the creative level. What? What is the is the problem? Is it that the people in the management level are frightened, uh, you know, frightened to make decisions about what films to go with and and back their the, whatever their word, if you like, because if one mistake and they're out, sort of thing. That's a lot of it. Their, their tenure is tentative at best. Um, there's so many changes. The places are sold and bought and changed. And, I mean, it's wild. So there's this drive to make a bunch of hit movies. Mm -hmm. But that, that's the part that always puzzles me, is they don't make the movies. Filmmakers make, them. Mm -hmm. but they take credit for them. I've, I've heard so many executives say, "My picture." <laughs> I'm like, "What? Your picture?" I remember reading a book called um, um, "Indecent Exposure." It was about the Beagleman affair. Al Hirschfeld was the, uh, at that time, was the president of, of Columbia, and he went over to England. There's a chat. There's a passage in the book, and he meets uh, Queen Elizabeth. And something. he says, "Well, I guess I do a good job making space pictures." I thought, "What? Steven Spielberg made close, and you didn't make it." Now, the executives read scripts and like projects and champion them, and that that for that they should be applauded. Mm. I have a lot of good things to say about an executive here named Larry Mark, who was basically our management liaison on Big Trouble, and he did a tremendous job of supporting us. He believed in the project. He believed in what I was doing. And so you get someone like that, and he's great. Now, he's a hero if the movie's a hit. He gets fired if it's, if it's not. That's a terrible situation to be in. Mm. Do you deal with, I mean, well, rather than putting it the other way around, does, does Barry Giller deal with you at all? And do you see him? Is he? I have seen him, yes. I've met with him. I uh, met with him when the project began. Uh, on and off, he doesn't have a day-to-day -day relationship with me. And do you think he should? As, as the director of a film? I don't know if there are any rules. But I mean, as, as a director, would as you director? prefer that you had uh, maybe a little more access to do it? Absolutely. Absolutely. If, 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 if I were running the studio, I would meet with directors and say, hey, we're partners. Um, I can talk to you about how to make your movie. You can talk to me about how to sell it. Maybe we both have some good ideas. I would do it that way. I would be collaborative. So one must assume that See, it's... Movie, making movies is collaborative, okay? You've yeah. got a writer and actors and cameramen and editors, and you've got a director at the helm, and he's getting the best out of everybody. Now, you would think the same thing applies to the head of a studio. He's got publicity and advertising, and he's got development, and he's got this, and get the best out of everybody, mm -hmm. including why not meet with a guy who's making your film and say, how's it going? But, no, you know. But is it... Is Obviously, the, the problem must be because you're willing to do it. It must be on the other side. Is it that Diller is so busy? Is he just that's part of it? Um, I, I really can't speak for him. I don't know why mm -hmm. he would. Um, or he, he's delegated responsibility to this. Exactly. So that's that, that's what a lot of a lot of executives do. Most executives. Do. However, once you get now again, there's a there's an A and a B list in, in Hollywood. Like for parties, so if I was Warren Beatty, 
I might get, I might see Barry the other one. But I'm not. I'm John Carter. I was Steven Spielberg I guarantee you. This is like the director's list, is it? Which did the most, it's, it's, it's a magical list, it's a, it doesn't ex actually physically exist. But there was one in Paramount, I got a hold of. There was a list, published list, A, B, and C, directors and writers. And I was stunned at who was where. So, obviously some unpredictable surprise. Very weird stuff. They're, who they thought would be a director for a, an A film. For a commercial, and who would not be? Like, wait a minute. What is an A film? I mean, what, what's, what's the difference between an A film and a B film? One that makes a lot of money. Yeah, but <laughs> that's all I can tell you. They but I mean, mean, before it's made, who knows? They think they know. Yeah. I um, I represent the Hollywood Reporter in Australia as their bureau chief. I mean, would you have any objection to this being written for the Hollywood Reporter? Probably rather it would. I'd rather it be in a regular press, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm obviously we'll do it for, for the... But. I will say one thing you can put in the Hollywood Reporter. I will never work for 20th Century Fox again. What's that? I told them. I told them. I sat, sat in the room. They were sitting in this room. I said, I'll never work for you guys again. Forget it. Specifically why? Because of the build-up of all the things you've talked about. I don't want to be there. treated this way. I will not be treated. Life's too short. I'm getting old. My hair is getting gray. I'm not going to put. I'm not going to put all this in. I'm just not going to handle it. So what? What were the major hassles then? Just oh, on the man, I mean, how many hours do you have? It, well, I mean, briefly, what? Then what sort of things? I can sum it all up in a general. In what we've been talking, it's a general attitude that I just choose not to do business, and it's hard enough to make a film. Nobody wants to make a bad and. What you have here is a case of, uh, I, I'd rather not say, let me don't get it. It doesn't matter. What does it matter? It doesn't matter. Of course. Okay. Except that when it's, said, when it's said in public, then there has to be a reassessment. And in that reassessment, maybe, attitudes will improve in some way. What you had here was you had Big Trouble in Little China, which was a project initiated by the previous regime. And mainly, the man responsible for it is Larry Gordon. Larry Gordon is a very strong, very talented producer, and he was a very strong and very talented head of studio. Rupert Murdoch bought the studio and changed, okay, the regime. And Larry and the new regime, you know, dovetail, okay? And so this picture got it green-lighted, and it was at the end of another regime. This is the last film that this financial partnership, SLM, partially financed with Fox. Beginning with Aliens, it's a new one. It's a new one. You see, so I'm just at the very end of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of crossover happened, okay? And when, you know what I mean by that. Their attitude. I think the new regime had to take control. Mm. Quickly. Absolutely. And just quickly take control. And uh, I made a kind of a picture that I don't think they understand or applaud. <clears throat> what are you saying studio doesn't, isn't entirely happy with the film? They love it. Well, they, love, they love it. They didn't understand what it was. I now love it because we've had some successful previews and it plays really well in the audience. But it's also a weird film. I can understand why you might say, huh? Until you get a, a, a crowd of people sitting in there and they're roaring and screaming and clapping. You know, let me put it another way. There was an executive at 20th Century Fox back in 1978. It was a, it was a woman. She came over and watched a movie called Halloween. And she's in a room alone. She's this is not scary. I don't understand this. What is this? She had she was not with an audience. She had no sense of what the film. Okay, well, you have three people sitting in a screening room watching a roller coaster ride. And they don't maybe not get it. Can we go back and talk a little bit about the film um, and and Kurt's casting. It. I mean, I mean, was a, was a screenplay written for him? Was he an automatic choice? He was the studio's first choice. Um, I wanted Clint Eastwood, but he wasn't available, and he was probably too old to do it. Although I don't think so. Um, but I love Kurt, and I've always loved working with him. And we've always decided, we always said to each other, listen, we'd love to work together. And if we have a project that we both like and agree on, let's do it. Kurt was schooled over at Disney, okay? And he was schooled, he is unlike any other actor. He knows cinema cameras. He knows 
how to act for a camera. He is cooperative. He is like, buoyant. He is giving. He's one of the most giving actors I've ever seen to other actors. And man, it's so much fun. Uh, but I think a lot of that comes from the schooling. But Disney, you said exactly what the lines were. I mean, you didn't change them. Or the camera was cut and it was done again. So he comes from a real different era of filming. Um, and we just love working with him. He's mm-hmm. enormously talented. So, so um, you were quite happy, obviously, when the studio presumably said, this is who we've got in mind. And Absolutely. I don't know, I mean, I'm just knowing now from what you've said about the story and the elements of the film. It, it doesn't seem to be, I mean, Clint, I don't think we brought much to it. Well, I think he has a, he's an enormously talented actor, Clint Eastwood. I think that he has a fabulous sense of humor. And I would love to have seen him play this guy, which would sort of upend a lot of the characters that he had done before. In other words, the silent, strong type would now be this blustery, uh, talking and falling on his That's side. It. You see what I'm saying? That would have been really amusing. So been, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kurt did it incredibly, though, I must say. And I couldn't be happy with it. Mm-hmm. What about your next project, then? Obviously, will not be for 20th Century Fox. Will be for 20th Century Fox, and um, I have several things I'm working on right now. I won't, I won't say what it's going to be. I'm working on a novel. I'm working on a record album. I'm uh, working on a couple of screenplays. I'm really working on a. You're actually writing a novel. Mm-hmm. I'm working on a big vacation to spend some time with my two-year-old son. During big trouble, I <laughs> didn't get to know as well as I'd like. You did do the music for me, I guess I did. And there's a music video, a rock and roll music video. Did you direct it? I did not direct it, but I am in it. You're in it? I am in it with two other directors, Nick Castle and Tommy Lee Wallace and myself are the Coupe de Villes. As a matter of fact, here you go. I'll show you who we are. You can have this. I give this. This is our first album. <laughs> I, I produced it and wrote the songs on it. And we, uh, uh, yeah, and we did a rock video. Nick Castle is also for all the records. Nick Castle did the Last Starfighter and uh, Boy You Can Fly. Tommy Lee Wallace did Home in Three. <laughs> I know it's That's absurd. Wonderful. It's absurd. Coupe de Ville. What? What's the What's the significance of it? Well, we started off because Nick can, can do a pretty good imitation of Elvis Presley, and we used to play at rap parties, and uh, I always drove Cadillacs. So Is it, this is getting... So that is just, a, that's something that I put out myself. Uh, I wanted to learn how to produce a record album because I want to do it. Did you want, you play, how many instruments? Almost every. That special album, what do you prefer? Guitar. Mm-hmm. Guitar is my favorite. Keyboard is also, I love to piano. So can we expect the national tour? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, what happens? Does it, does it get picked up by MTV? Are you going to do a clip or? Yeah. Uh, doing the whole thing? So, so is this, I mean, do we see now the start of John Carpenter's work? Well, we see. We'll just, we'll just see what <laughs> John Carpenter wants to do. <laughs> what I really want to do, though, in, in line of what I've been telling you about Hollywood now, is it's hard enough to create something. I want to have fun with it because I think it shows on the screen. So I'm determined to keep the enthusiasm in my work and not get beaten down by the rest of it. Of, of all the films that you've done, which one are you most satisfied with that you felt achieved up, up on the screen when you said that? Each one is so different from the other. It's hard to say. Each one tried something different. Um, I know the hardest one to do is The Fog. It was the most elusive of them all. Uh, the most physically hard is Starman because it was a movie about America and we trudged across every Part of it. Mm. Um, Somebody said it was the first space road movie. Exactly. It happened one night from outer space. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm happy if, with different parts of different films. I mean, there's parts of, of Dark Star, which I made for $60,000 a decade and a half ago, that I say, wow, that really worked. We didn't have anything. There's parts of Big Trouble I say, man, I've never seen anything like that before. There's Jeff's and Karen's performance in, in Starman, I say, well, I'm really proud of that. 
I like different things about different movies. Mm. What, what about the creative inspiration of filmmaker, other filmmakers? Or Howard Hawks, Louis well, uh, Hitchcock, John Ford, well, all the classic directors. Mm-hmm. Roman Polanski, I think, the greatest living director. Were you a, and had the movie go with it? Ah, that's all I did. That's all I did. When did you start? Were you, were you about Four years, years old. African Queen, 1952. Was it a good memory? No, they were in Canada. I'll never forget the Legion on his back. Although when I saw them years later, I thought that was what I got so wired up about. Well, what's showing in the African Queen? Was it? Well, what other stuff? Yeah. What about, what about the actual filmmaking? I mean, were you an eight millimeter camera? Eight years old, daddy's eight millimeter camera. Get my friends out there and make a movie. Hold it. Mm-hmm. Was there ever a possibility that uh, your career would have been something else that would have been medicine or architecture? It was either going to be a rock and roll band that I was in, or it was going to be movies. That was the choice. How long was it rock and roll band? Uh, high school and college. We played every week. With one of the guys in this group that I grew up with. And, you know, he stayed in Kentucky and he played bars or come out here in five minutes. I came out in five minutes. Seems to be <laughs> Thanks very much. Sure. Over the decades, John also took his musical talents onto the stage, forming a band in the mid 1970s called the Coop de Villes, which included future movie directors Tommy Lee Wallace and Nick Castle. He's still writing, directing and producing for film and TV, including music videos. John turned 76 in January 2024.